All right. I'd like you guys to turn this morning, please, over to Galatians chapter 5. And we were talking about the love walk, and this is one of the most important chapters in the New Testament relating to how important it is for us to walk in the love of God. So I wanted to deal with this this morning, if we can. 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, Galatians chapter 5. And we'll just start reading basically at about verse 13. And we'll read down through. And I am going to read the Amplified Bible. Let's start at verse 13. For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh, an opportunity or an excuse for selfishness. But through love, here's that word again, agape, you should serve one another. Everybody say, serve one another. Serve one another. Important that you understand that if you're trying to serve God and you're not serving Him out of love, you're going to get burned out. I want all of my staff to hear what I'm saying. If you try to serve in the church or serve God or do something for God and you stop tapping into the love of God and you start getting over here into this is where religion comes from, this is where legalism comes from, this is where frustration comes from, this is where burnout comes from, this is where hating church comes from. A lot of people would never use that term hating church, but I'm telling you, a lot of people I know, I know some people as an example. One of our churches, I'm not going to tell you which one that we established years ago, the pastors there did not have any children. And because they did not have any children, in their lives, because they were fairly young, especially him, he was able to go and go and go like a gopher, like young people do. About 90% of everything he did probably wasn't of God, about 10% was. And you learn as you get older the importance of focusing in on what's really important. But he didn't know that. And so with, with, with his zeal and enthusiasm, what he would do is he, would, he, he wanted his whole staff to be like that. So they were down there every day at church. He was in all the worship meetings. He was in all the youth meetings. He was in all of every meetings. And his staff, or the people that worked with him, or the good people that he had, were there at church literally almost every night. Now, most of these people had families. He didn't. And what began to happen was that because he would preach things, and I would come and preach things that, about dedication and consecration, you have to have that. How many of you know you got to have that? You, Jesus has got to be Lord, or we're all in trouble. What, what he did was mishear some things because he was young. And I used to tell him, I said, man, those people can't come down there like that all the time. They got kids. I mean, they got this thing and this function at church, at school and this thing and that thing. You know, but to him, man, his leadership people had to be there. It was, they had to be there because that was what was really important was church. And what happened was, he, over a period of about two years, he burned out the whole bunch of people. And now those, a lot of those people aren't even serving God anymore. He's not serving God anymore. And I, I don't want that to happen. What we, what we have to do is we have to have a balance. Everybody say balance. The Bible says a false abomination, or I mean a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. God never called us to kill, to kill ourselves with some kind of pseudo-religious uh, demonstrations of thinking that, you know, more is better. What he wants us to do is, first of all, have a relationship with him that we build over a period of time in different areas. You know, uh, as an example, if I can use this illustration, I'm going to use it this morning. One of the problems we have as Americans is we are Americans. And the, uh, the Word of God is a Middle Eastern book. It comes from Middle Eastern people. It comes from Jewish Hebrew people. Actually, even they found out now that the New Testament wasn't originally written in Greek. Most of it was written in Hebrew. And they were Hebrew, th Hebrew thinking people anyway. 
And you have to understand something. Everything that was going on back there, and, and when Jesus was, was, was uh, uh, making his uh, Gospels, you know, when he was saying something in the Gospels, he's always thinking about covenant. Everything to them was about covenant. And so, we have the idea that we have the old and new covenant. And really, the idea is not there in the Bible. The idea is that God started dealing with man he did, it started with Adam, he did covenants with Noah and, and Abraham, and you know, he, he began to develop all that. Came through, Jesus came to perfect all that. That's the idea. And give us that, that the, the, what he had in mind from the beginning. Amen. So it's not like the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's more like, you know, a, a completing of the covenant that God was putting into the, into the earth. You all understand what I'm talking about there? And so, our relationship with God is like that. God never intended for somebody to get saved and just, that's it. He intended to establish us on an, with an ongoing covenant. As an example, there's the blood covenant. How many know that's how we get in? Through Jesus Christ. But there's also something the Bible calls in the Old Testament the salt covenant, which was friendship. God wants to, have, he wants to be, develop friendship with us. Then there's a sandals covenant. If you, if you study that in the Old, Old Testament, I don't have time to do that. But what that means is inheritance. Most people never walk much in the inheritance God has for them. Well, God wants to be able to trust us so that he can give us his inheritance. Our inheritance on this earth. So there's these different things. And, you know, he wants us to continually develop our personal relationship with him. If my staff at this particular church, if we get to the point to where we are, we are not walking in love and serving God out of the love of God, then what we're going to get is we're going to have problems and strife. You know, it will get to the point where, oh, that person just annoys me. And they're always sending stuff over. They can't find out what this is and that thing. And, and when, you're in, when, you're, when you're not tapping into love, it gets annoying. It's like work. How many have ever had a secular job? You go to your secular job, people annoy you. Well, you're not tapping into the love of God. Nothing should really annoy us that bad. Right? So he says it's real important for us to serve God out of what? Everybody say it. Love. Say it again. Love. If you train everybody that way, then we'll be better off. So that's the first thing I want you to see here. He says, out of love, we should what? Serve one another. How many know that's, that's, that's good, right? Amen. Verse 14. For the whole law concerning human relationships is compiled within this one precept, you shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. The whole law concerning every human relationship should be compiled within this. That's marriage, that's your relationship between you and God, relationship between you and your spouse, relationship between you and your children, relationship between you and your, your, your bosses, relationship between you and your co-workers, relationships between you and your, where you go to school, the people you go to school with, your teachers, relationship between you and the person at the hot dog stand. Relationships. Everything is compiled within that one relationship. Nothing else is important to understand. That is important to understand. If you understand that, all other relationships in your life can be handled properly. Now that's important, isn't it? So I would encourage you to study love all the time. For the rest of your life. Forever. Because you never get to the end of it. You never get as good as you could be. But that enters over into how you communicate with people. It, it, it enters over into what is appropriate in a relationship between a, a husband and a wife. It enters over into what is important in a relationship between a children and their parents when they're young, children and parents when they leave home because there's certain things that are not appropriate. When kids leave home, that was appropriate when they lived there. And if you don't know that, you'll override some of the laws of love and you'll have strife. A lot of folks need to understand this. The Bible's going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. How many know that you need to study, to, show, to be quiet? And there's, there's, there's areas of the Word of God <coughs> that where it says, don't be busybodies in other people's affairs. 
When you start being a busybody in somebody else's affairs, even your own family's affairs, when you're not supposed to, it causes problems. That is a very, very important um, subject and aspect. It is not important for you to know everything about me. It's not important for me to know every little thing about you. I, I am not supposed to know every th little thing about you. I'm not supposed to be delving into every little thing you do, your little decisions. You know, there's some preachers during the 1960s, they had a move of God that was basically got out of order. Yes, and it, and it developed into what they called the shepherdship, and, and Sherry was, was, uh, understands that. The shepherdship or the, uh, cont I call it the control thing where the pastors needed to know everything about you if you're going to buy a car what color of clothes to wear how to do this who to marry what to do that's not any of my business ladies and gentlemen my business is what happens here at the congregation within the leadership of the church it, it is my business to know that you're living right if you're going to be on staff come on everybody it, it, I do have certain things I need to know but I do not need to tell you who to marry um, yeah, I, I do need to tell you the principles of you need to marry in the Lord. Right? But I'm not here to say, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt pick out her and you should marry him. And thus, you know, and that's what they were doing. That's controlling. You know what my job is? My job as a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is to give you a good meal so you can develop a relationship with God and hear for him for yourself. My job is to pray for you. My job is to do everything I possibly can in my life to make sure that you know and fulfill your, your, your God-given plan and purpose. That's what my job is. My job is not to embarrass people. My job is not to get on the telephone and try to figure out every little thing about somebody else. It is not my job who your friends are, where you go to eat, who you go to eat with. That is between them and the other people. And when you start understanding that, your life becomes really great because you don't have to, you're not so concerned about, you don't have to be concerned about trying to control everything. You can feel good in your life about what you do. Everybody say amen. As an example, if Norm and Lynette want to have friends with somebody else other than just us, <laughs> that's none of my business. And I shouldn't get all uptight about it. In fact, I should rejoice that Norm and Lynette have friends. They need friends. You know, some people, when, when Norm and Lynette were going with us, sometimes they would go with us because Norm and Lynette were in a position to do so. And so we would take them with us on the road. Some people you know, felt, felt, felt threatened by that. Because pa Norman and Lynette are getting so close to Pastor Tom. And How many know that's none of your business? I'm just going to let that sit. It's not, no, that's not anybody's business except me, God, me, Stella, Norman and Lynette. But you see, in a, in a church congregation, what happens is a lot of times when something like that happens, people get their, feel, their Mickey Mouse feelings hurt because they haven't grown enough to realize that it's really none of their business what, what happens there. And if I have a relationship with Norman, and you know, here's the thing. You're going to have closer relationships with some people than others. There's just no way around that as a pastor. And the staff needs to understand that. Jesus had that. He had the closest relationship with three people. He had a closer relationship with 12. He had a closer relationship from 70 than he did the multitude. That is always going to be the case because the kingdom of God operates that way. It's the same way with you. You're going to have a closer relationship with people at your job, some people at your job or your business or whatever than you do other people. That's just the way it is. <coughs> when you do that, there is a opportunity for people not to understand that and there'll be an opportunity in that relationship for people to get jealous, <coughs> people to get upset, People who want to know. I want to know why you're doing this. Why you're doing that. Why you're doing this. How come? How come? That's none of your business. We should not cross the line of that. We need to only be involved 
where we need to be involved. Everybody say amen. This is the love of God. It's understanding that. Now, so we don't have time to get into all that, but let's keep on going here. But in verse uh, 15, but if you bite and devour one another in partisan strife, be careful that you are not, your whole fellowship are not consumed by one another. Everybody say strife. How many here have ever heard of, the, of a term called cancer? Cancer kind of devours somebody's body. Literally eats it up, right? This is what he's talking about. Did you know many, many congregations are full of cancer? They're full of people that have strife, haven't learned how dangerous that is, still insist on their own way. And, and even though Pastor Tom or uh, some other preacher gets up and preaches these things until we're blue in the face, it doesn't really hit that, those particular individuals between the eyes like it should. They still go out and they still talk and they still say things they shouldn't say. And they're still involved in criticizing. When you lo- when everybody say this with me out loud, criticism. criticism. Say complaining. complaining. Did you know that God hates complaining? He doesn't just dislike it, he hates it. In fact, he says if you complain, you'll get destroyed by the destroyer. It'll literally open the devil up, it, your life will be, you'll open your, your life up to the devil and he can begin, begin to come in and still kill and destroy. Complaining is a very dangerous thing, as well as talking in strife and getting into strife in a congregation and being jealous one of another and all of that. So we have to keep that out. We have to expose that. We've got to constantly remind ourselves that we are here to serve one another in love. We're here to serve the Lord. Nobody's going to be perfect. We've got to minister grace to each other when we make mistakes. We've got to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is not a side issue with God. This is the number one thing that kills churches. The number one thing the pastor has to struggle with or the leaders have to struggle with is constantly reminding yourself of your place, what your role is, and not getting out of your role and being happy with your role. Right? Then he goes on and says, verse 16, But I say, walk and live, live habitably in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit, then you will certainly not be gratifying the cravings and desires of the flesh, of the human nature without God. How many know when you walk in the Spirit, you walk in love? When you walk in love, you walk in the Spirit. I've told you that before. It's true, isn't it? All these things are interconnected because you can't even talk. I'm, I'm talking to the Pakistan guys about Zoe, the God kind of life. That's the love of God. It's the presence of God. It's who God is. His life, his love, the spirit of God. All these things are, the, are basically speaking of the same thing. He's putting it in different terms. Verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit or your recreated spirit. There was no... Uh, it's up to the translators to, you know, when they, when they put the word spirit in the Bible... They had to choose whether he's talking about the Holy Spirit or your human spirit or whatever spirit he's talking about. So sometimes they would capitalize it. Sometimes it was a small s. I really think he's talking about in this passage of scripture the, the recreated human spirit because that's where the Holy Spirit dwells. In a person, you've got to learn how to be controlled by your spirit, not your flesh. Right? So it really doesn't matter one way or the other. The Holy Spirit's still the, the person who's in there doing this directing but uh, anyway for the desires of our flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh godless human nature for these are agnostic to one another continually withstanding in conflict with each other so that you are not free but are prevented from doing what you desire to do but if you are guided led by the Holy Spirit you are not subject to the law now the doings, practices of the flesh are clear, obvious. They are immorality, impurity, and indecency, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, ill temper, selfishness, divisions, dissensions, party spirit, fractions, sex, which particular opinions and heresies. All right. I want to stop here for just a second and make, a, make a, uh, a point because I'm not just talking to Americans here. One of the greatest problems in the Pakistan church 
how many know there are Christians in Pakistan? There's lots of Muslims, there's Christians, and then, and then people are being converted from these different things to Christianity, even as I speak, many of them that are listening to me, or the pastor that is giving this message, basically, uh, in the Bible school. And I want to make this point. They're, one of their problems they have there, that, you know, you say, to, if you looked at this list, you say, well, we have the sensuality part here in America, but I don't know too many Christians that are practicing sorcery. Over there, though, they can be Christians and they're still practicing a lot of black magic and stuff. That's a problem. It's an issue there. So I want the people that are listening to me over there to understand that those type of practices are, cl are, are clear here of the flesh. You need to stop doing those type of practices. Amen. You can't mix Christianity with witchcraft. Doesn't work. So, whatever the problem is here, he says all that's bad. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, Ill, Ill temper, selfishness, divisions, dissensions, party spirit, fractions, sex, peculiar opinions and heresies, getting off into little groups and doing your own thing following some teacher out there who teaches a Bible study in their home without any covering or understanding of what's going on. A lot of that. In fact, when we first came here up to this area, that's basically what charismatics did. They kind of wandered around to these little places where people were teaching them all to be prophets and stuff. And that's just, all that kind of stuff is just, whenever you have that kind of thing, it's almost never right. And all it does is cause confusion in people's lives. And you come into a place like this and then you really get trained and all that stuff goes by the wayside. Because it just puffs you up. Puffs people up into pride and things. But, now we got to the point to where we, 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 we want to read verse 21. Envings, drunkens, crowsings and the like. I warn you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those who practice such things, do such things, or practice such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, we don't want to be practicing these things, Right? All right? Now, here's the part where we wanted to go. Verse 22, I'm going to read out of the King James Version. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Out of the Amplified, but the fruit of the, of the Holy Spirit, the work of the, which His presence within us accomplishes, is love. Saying the same thing. You can say the recreated human spirit or the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's in our recreated human spirit and it's because of the presence of God and the love of God that we can do this. But I want you all to say this with me out loud. However you want to believe about that, that's your own business. But say this. The fruit, the fruit. of the what? The fruit. Spirit is what? Love. Now, I really believe with all of my heart that's what he's saying there. The fruit, of the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Period. Because God is what? Love. Now, if you walk in love, you'll have peace. If you walk in love, you'll have patience, and kindness, and goodness, and meekness, and all these other fruits. I'd like you to picture in your mind, if you can, an orange. How many have ever taken an orange and peeled it? Then you got just the, 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 the orange, but it's like little sections. You can kind of pull the orange apart, and they're in sections, and you take a section out and eat it. That's kind of what he's saying here, I believe. I believe the fruit of the Spirit is like the whole orange. You know, love is like the whole orange if you peel it. And if you pull out a section of that, it might be peace or meekness or whatever. But without love, you won't have any of the fruit because God is love. So if you practice love, then you will have these other fruits manifest. Amen. You see, because you cannot practice the love of God and not be patient. That will begin to develop. It's part of love. Love is what? First Corinthians chapter 13. Patient and what kind, you know? So, right? If you practice love, you will have some meekness, right? Gentleness. Goodness. Kindness. Peace. Joy. How many know that if you're practicing love, you'll have joy? And joy is, the joy of the Lord is our what? Our strength. Now these traits, these, these fruits of the Spirit, 
are extremely powerful in our lives. One of the things that the body of Christ has not done is teach us very well about certain things. If I was to mention to you the term spiritual warfare, what do you think of? Most people think about praying, binding and loosing and casting down and rebuking the devil and all that stuff. <clears throat> but literally, the, some of the greatest uh, weapons we have of our warfare to absolutely destroy the work of the enemy are the fruits of the Spirit. People like to talk about the gifts of the Spirit as being great weapons, and they are. Praise God. But the fruits of the Spirit are very powerful weapons too. People don't think about them like this. But let me tell you something about, uh, there was a lady uh, called Corey Tamboon. Corey was in a, in a, uh, a prison camp in, in, in the Holocaust. You know, she was a Christian in amongst, but, uh, in amongst a bunch of, of Jewish people and then the Nazis. And that woman uh, walked in love in the midst of all of that hatred. And people's lives were literally changed. Because you see, when the love of God is manifesting, it pulls down strongholds. Satan cannot, the love of God will find a way in to people's hearts, even though they may be bound up with all kinds of darkness. As an example of that, how many know when Jesus ministered to the madman of Gadara? Jesus walked in so much power and love that when Jesus walked on the scene, even though that man had thousands, literally thousands of, of demons in him, legions of demons, a legion of demons in him, thousands of demons, that there was something that penetrated all of that darkness inside of that man got to him and he ran toward Jesus and started worshiping him and calling out for help. This is why I'm trying to explain to you if you allow the love of God, learn to allow the love of God to be the motivating force in your life, a lot of the problems and issues that you've, you, that you've had over the years will dissipate. People ask me sometimes, well, Pastor Tom, how come um, I have a hard time winning people to Christ? It's because a lot of times their attitudes stink. I mean, every time you turn around, they're turning around, they're sharp with their tongue, or they're saying something that turns people off, or people watch it. I remember when I was working at Vegland, uh, years ago, I started learning these truths. And one of the things that I had to learn very quickly was <clears throat> that I was the only Christian there. So I had a responsibility, basically, for the whole bunch of them people. So I was young in the things of God, and I, at times I made mistakes, some serious mistakes. But I would go to the, all the guys when I would make a mistake. Like, let, let's say that I got angry with somebody. They weren't used to when somebody got angry with somebody, them, them later on coming to them and saying, I'm really sorry I got angry with you. I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. You know, that's not normal amongst the heathens most of the time. Not like that. Or things, just normal things that they wouldn't call the big deal, I thought were a big deal. And I would tell them I'm sorry and they didn't even think it was a big deal. But to me it was a big deal because my conscience bothered me about it. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? That began to plant a lot of seeds. And the people at the, at the, at the dock, we had a love-hate relationship. Because I used to be the biggest sinner of mall, see. Now, I'm like the Apostle Paul. They all didn't know what was going on. So we had this love-hate relationship. I knew these guys very well. I had been part of their lives. Now it was different. But they still, they begin to come to me and they begin to confide in me about what was going on in their personal lives. And sometimes they'd even cry and stuff. And I'd just be at the dock and I'd be, and I'd be talking to them. And uh, I did this for, you know, several years. With no results, no tangible results. I would preach to them when I got a chance and share with them the gospel. But no tangible results really came out of that. Uh, at least I couldn't see it. God's always working though. And so I got to the point to where I had created, if I could say this, and I don't mean this in a, in a prideful way, a pretty good... Um, a pretty good idea for them of what Christianity really was because I knew where they were coming from. 
I didn't criticize them. I didn't judge them. I didn't hop on the bandwagon of trying to, you know, ju uh, jump up. You're all going to hell. You're a bunch of, you know, nasty people and don't smoke, don't drink. I didn't do that at all. I just basically tried to show them the love of God as best I could. And Irene and I worked hard at that. Because I cared about all these people. I would give them books and Bible tracts. At Christmas time, I'd give them presents. You know, I, I just did everything I knew to do. I wasn't perfect by any means, but I, I thought I had done a pretty good job. I was the only one standing for Christ, man. And I mean, that can be rough when you're, you know, a proto stock with, with truck drivers. Every once in a while, we'd have a Christian truck driver came in. And that was kind of cool. We had some good ones. We had some guys actually live for God. But most of the time, I was by myself alone. And so one day, they hired a guy that was going to be working with me that was a Christian. And I found out he was a Christian. It happened to be a brother that was not a spirit-filled Christian. He came from a certain denomination that most of you are familiar with. A lot of you came from. And this brother, I tell you what, I was so glad. Because even though he wasn't a spirit-filled Christian, at least to have some fellowship seemed kind of cool. And so we, you know, I talked to him and he was excited about Christ. And I thought, wow, that's really awesome. He's excited about Christ and so on. And he's going to be a good, you know. And I'll tell you something. I, I worked hard, folks. I, I did four jobs. I'm not exaggerating. I did four people's jobs down there at one time. That's how hard I worked for the same amount of money. They knew how valuable I was. That's why they gave me. That's why I ended up getting that promotion and sent. You know, I mean, they, they came in. They had those people come in and interview me. And I got this job. The truth of the matter was I, I was well worth, you know, four times what I was making there. They, they never gave anybody a raise. Because Christians are supposed to be the best workers, right? And uh, so this guy comes in, and I'll tell you what, he undid almost everything that I did in two years in a matter of just a few weeks. He was so obnoxious, this guy, in his witnessing. It, 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 I mean, I'd sit there and go, he's obnoxious. I wouldn't want that guy around. He wouldn't work. He'd, he's, he, he's always wanting to preach to people. And the way he preached to people was obnoxious. Shouldn't drink, shouldn't smoke, shouldn't cuss, shouldn't do this. You're just, you know, you're all bad. And you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And I just obnoxiously, though. There, are, there is a time to bring up hell. But you don't have to be obnoxious to people personally, you know, and all of that kind of thing. And this guy just was, he's like one of these guys that you see out in the, sometimes standing out in the, in the, in the cities with the sign on, you know, Turner, Burn, you're all going to hell. Just obnoxious guys screaming at people. My wife was in Panama. And uh, she lives with her, when she was there, she stayed with her mother. And her mother has an apartment there. And it's right downtown, in a bad section of town. And it's up, uh, you know, on top of this bar. And if you can kind of picture in your mind, in Panama it's very hot. They don't have air conditioning, most of the, the people like her. She doesn't have air conditioning. So what they do is when they build these buildings, they build them with holes. You know, like, uh, you know, the concrete goes up and then there's holes in them, you know, like, so that the air can flow in so that you don't, like, die. <laughs> and so you can hear everything I mean everything on the streets you can hear them you know the, the cars, the people talking and my mother-in-law has grown up you know she's used to that but Stella wasn't used to that she's not used to that anymore so it, it's awful loud and the bar would be at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning they, they, the bar is still going and people are drunk and you know you, it's hard to sleep Stella got very little sleep when she was there but you know what the most obnoxious part of that was? The guy across the street that was the pastor that had a church. He was so obnoxious. He, he had that, he turned that, his, 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 his um, preaching thing up so loud that everybody on the street could hear it. And he would scream and he would preach obnoxiously about, you know, sin. And my wife said, it just, it just made her cringe every time this guy came on. This guy had a congregation, you know, people who followed him or whatever. But, you know, he would just, he did really more, he was doing more damage than good, folks. 
by, not, not because he wasn't preaching some things that were true, but by the way he was doing it. He was not really a witness to that community. He was being obnoxious. Well, this guy did that. And I tell you, honestly, the things that I had tried to plant within those people, he almost destroyed. And they, and they started coming against Christianity and thinking against Christianity because of the way he was. Can you all see what I'm saying here? So we need to be very careful about approaching anything when it comes to doing anything for God and realizing that if we're going to do something for the Lord, people are watching us. So if the love of God is not the key thing that's happening in our lives and we're not expressing the meekness and the kindness and the gentleness and so on, then people are not going to respond. But if you do that, it's very powerful. The devil cannot overcome the fruits of the Spirit. There's nothing he can do with that. Peace drives him nuts. Kindness drives him nuts. Right? Faithfulness drives him nuts. Do you know how powerful faithfulness is? The Bible says the faithful man will abound with blessings. And the Bible also says, though, before we all amen too much, a faithful man is very hard to find. I ask uh, sometimes why God is using me the way he is. It's probably the only thing I can tell you is I've been faithful. I'm not, I'm not, it's just being faithful. God will use anybody. He'll use a donkey. He'll use, you know, people who, who, who want to brag on them being used by God. And, wow, I've done this and that. You know, the, the only thing I can tell you is, is that if you, and, and you know this thing, it's really, a, it's kind of annoying me. I have a lot of people, they email me. You're a mighty man of God. I'm not a mighty nothing. Listen, listen to me. If you're in my skin, I'm, I, I see the flaky side of me. You're a great man of God. There's nobody great but Jesus, folks. If there's anything good that comes out of this guy, it's Jesus Christ only. It's not me. If there's any fruit coming out, it's because of him, not me. You understand what I'm talking about? It's because of his presence. Yes, I have to yield to it. All of that kind of thing. But to me, that's laughable. We say, this man's a great man of God. That man's a great man of God. I know some of them. And some of them have flakiness. You know, they're human beings. But the fruits of the Spirit, that recreated Spirit, when we're hooking up to Jesus Christ, are extremely powerful. When you begin to operate in those things, people will get, they can't resist it. God. It's, it's tough to resist him. You know, my wife and I, when we were um, younger, boy, life goes by fast, doesn't it? When we were younger, we lived in Reno, Nevada, in a place called Fernley, which was outside of Reno, Nevada, because I don't like cities. That's just my, my particular, you know, liking and, and disliking. I don't like cities. To me, a city is Sturgeon Bay. Green Bay is too big. You know. And it's not a big city. And uh, we, we had this uh, a home. It was pretty good sized. You know. And um, Stella had a cousin. You know. And, and, and her parents were like my, my wife's parents. They wanted her to have a better life. So uh, the goal was to get Stella, when she was 15, she, she got on a plane and came to America for, to, to be, you know, to get educated and hopefully live here and have a better life because it's tougher down there to, to have a better life. And so we got uh, uh, Stella's uh, uncle ask if, if we would take his daughter, her cousin, into our home from overseas. The only way she's going to get in here, get a visa or whatever they do, they had to go through this. And you know, during those years you had to jump hoops, man, to get in, which they should they should ease up on that and they should they should, you know, uh, make it hard to get in here illegally and, and easier to get in for the good people, right? But I mean, you know, so we had to do it a certain way and anyway um, I said, forget that because, you know, she was like uh, I don't know, she was like 18, 20 1920s, 21, she was, you know, Panamanian girl, pretty girl. Uh, they're all model. They all look like models. Have you noticed Pakistan's like that, too? I don't know what, what's up. What's wrong with America? I don't know. Anyway, um, so, 
You're supposed to laugh. That's supposed to be a joke. But anyway, a lot of it's true. But, you know, she, so I, I looked at her and I said, oh, you know, she's not really, she's not a believer. That's going to be pr- trouble. I don't need that kind of trouble in my life. Here, here she's going to come over there and she's going to be wanting, the boys are going to be after her and she's not a Christian and I, you know, you know, that's just trouble, right? And, uh, so, but my wife said, well, no, I don't, I don't think that's going to be a good idea. So we prayed about it, but the Lord kept putting it on my heart to have her come. So finally, after uh, some indecision on it, we, 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 we finally said, okay, here's some rules and regulations. You got to, if you'll come to church with us and, you know, and, and you'll, you have a curfew and all of that, you can come. And so she came over and she, she abided by what we asked her to do. You know, I didn't say anything else to her. I didn't really preach to her all the time. I didn't, um, I didn't bang her over the head. She came to church. She heard what we said at church and she saw how we lived at home. About three weeks into that, here's a heathen. She's not a Christian at all. And she just, we were just observing us. One night, we're sitting there in our room, in our bed, and we hear this knock at the door. We open the door, and here is this girl. And she looked like Tammy Faye Baker on her best day. Just makeup all over, crying, sobbing like you wouldn't believe. And she just said, i got to get right with God. That's the way it should be, folks. And if you're not experiencing that, there's not much love. You can do that anywhere. You can take that anywhere with you. Because you are a carrier of the love of God. Everybody say amen. amen. So... Galatians study it. Galatians chapter 5, the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. If you walk in love, all those other things will be in your life. Joy, peace. And if you lack lack any of those things, there's there's a lack of disconnect with love there. I lack some of them. I'm working on it. How about you? There's a disconnect with the love of God there. I really, uh, my goal today at this time in my life, and and I'm finishing with this because we're out of time today. I've got about four minutes or three minutes. My goal in life, at this part of, uh, of my life, is to teach uh, the next generation, whether it be here, overseas, or wherever they're hearing me, to do things the right way. Because our Bible tells us, Jesus said this, he said, the number one thing that we're going to face in the last days is deception. And deception comes in to the body of Christ when we lack love. Spirit of error gets in. People get into weird doctrines, start seeing weird things, saying weird things, doing weird things, acting weird things, preaching weird things. If we really are people that focus on the love walk, there's a protection in that that you'll never get from anything else. It's important. So I encourage you guys here and that are listening to me, to make your life, a, your life goal, to be a lover. Say, I want to be a faith person. Well, faith worketh by love. Right? I want to be a spirit person. Yeah, the Holy Ghost is going to be effectively worked through you, through love. The gifts of the Spirit and everything else. It's all interconnected. Amen. So, I want to be a great person of prayer. You're going to have to learn how to walk in love. Amen. All right. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to pray.